We're looking at Psalm 97, and you have your handouts uh, on that. And um, let me see if we can make that menu go away. I think we may have to endure that. I don't know whether that goes away or not. But anyway. <laughs> okay, so... Um, we are wanting to finish our study in the fourth book of the Psalms, and we have this today, and then next Sunday, and the next Sunday, the last Sunday of January, we're going to start our, our 2023 study in the book of Esther. So I think we're going to find that to be very interesting. But we're here in the Psalms, in uh, Psalm 97, and we're in a group of Psalms that are particularly praising the Lord. He is, in fact, the Lord. And so I want to read this Psalm, and then let's talk about it this morning. Psalm 97, the Lord reigns. That's everything that's going on is stop to think. The Lord reigns. Let the earth rejoice. Let the many coastlands be glad. Clouds and thick darkness are all around him. Righteousness and justice are the foundation of his throne. Fire goes before him and burns up his adversaries all around. His lightnings light up the world. The earth sees and trembles. The mountains melt like wax before the Lord. Before the Lord of all the earth. The heavens proclaim his righteousness and the peoples see his glory. All worshipers of images are put to shame who make their boast in worthless idols. Worship him, all you gods. Zion hears and is glad. The daughters of Judah rejoice because of your judgments, O Lord. For you, O Lord, are most high over all the earth. You are exalted far above all gods. O oh, you who love the Lord, hate evil. He preserves the lives of his saints. He delivers them from the hand of the wicked. Light is sown for the righteous and joy for the upright in heart. Rejoice in the Lord, O oh, you righteous, and give thanks to his holy name. Let's pray together. Father, we thank you for the scripture that you give us this morning to focus upon you. For you are the Lord. Help us, Lord, to see what you have given us in this psalm. We pray that you would be honored by the worship that you receive thereby. In Jesus' name, amen. We are in a group of psalms, which we have referred to as divine kingship psalms. This is a set of psalms between 93 and 100 that... Focus on the theme that's in the first verse of our psalm here, the Lord reigns. In fact, several of them use that phrase, Psalm 93, that opens this group of psalms, the Lord reigns. We see it here in, in Psalm 97, verse 1. The previous psalm, Psalm 96, verse uh, 10, say among the nations, the Lord reigns. Psalm 99, verse 1, the Lord reigns. Let the peoples tremble. All through these psalms, even when they don't use that phrase, they refer to the Lord as the king. And so we refer to this group as divine kingship psalms. They are celebrating the fact that the Lord is king. Now, this group of psalms is set within a larger group, which is book four, that runs from Psalm 90 to Psalm 106. So, and that's where we began our study in this book four. But then we came upon this smaller group, and this is what we've zeroed in on. So, <clears throat> the context for Psalm 97, our psalm um, this morning, we can look back to the way in which this little group began. Psalm 93 begins with the phrase that we have in our psalm, the Lord reigns. Psalm 93 is a very short psalm, and it emphasizes the fact that because of his reign, the world is in order. There is an establishment of order in the world because of his reign. And even though there are 
there are forces in the world, which in that Psalm is uh, seen as the sea, um, the Lord has placed a limit on that. And uh, he controls it. So that's what we have in Psalm 93. And so our Psalm is taking that theme and emphasizing, re-emphasizing that. But also Psalm 94, the second Psalm, speaks of God as the God of vengeance. And uh, that entire Psalm is given to that theme. Now, <clears throat> he's the God of vengeance against evildoers, against the wicked, which is necessary if there's going to be order if there's going to be stability because evil threatens the order of God. Our psalm is related to both of those. It takes both of those themes, the establishment of order of God's sovereign kingship and the fact that he deals with the problem of evil, and it addresses it in a very specific way. Our psalm sits between Psalm 96 and 98 which right before Christmas, we looked at those two Psalms, 96 and 98, which were the Psalms from which Isaac Watts took the material for that famous Christian hymn, Joy to the World. All nature is singing. That's what we have in 96 and 98. There's this orchestra that's happening. I mean, it's musical. There is praise being given to God because he indeed reigns over all things. So the entire earth is rejoicing at the reign of God. The interesting thing about those two Psalms, they both end in the same way. And they end surprisingly because you're rejoicing in the reign of God, his, his wonderful power and the way in which he orders all things. And then you you, you come down to the end, all the trees of the forest are singing for joy before the Lord, for he comes. For he comes, we repeat it for emphasis. He comes to judge the earth, and he will judge the world in righteousness and the peoples in his faithfulness. Same way with Psalm 98. The rivers are clapping their hands. The hills are singing for joy before the Lord. For he comes to judge the earth, and he will judge the world with righteousness and the peoples with equity. Now, <clears throat> that conclusion to both of those Psalms, 96 and 98, Psalm 97, right in between them, is addressing that, that he comes and he will judge the world in righteousness. When we zoom out to the whole of book four, again, 93 to 100 is the kingship Psalms. Book four is 90 to 106. So we've got, we zoom out a little bit within book four, we can see this. We see in in book four, that there is this theme of the wrath of God against evil. Psalm 90 began this way with Moses, talking about the fact going all the way back to creation and the fall and God's punishment because of the fall into sin. And Moses says, you, you turn us back into dust. And Moses says, who considers the power of your wrath? Who considers the power of your anger? We see in Psalm 92 that the enemies of the Lord will perish, Psalm 92, verse 9. There is a theme running through book four, celebrating God's sovereignty over all things as a reminder that there is the wrath of God. And his enemies will be destroyed. We see that there is in Psalm 90 and 95 and all the way to Psalm 106, there's a, 
a little sub-theme of Israel experiencing the wrath of God. When Moses was talking about, you turn us all back to dust, and who considers the power of your anger? He also talks about the fact that Israel saw that. They experienced the discipline of God. And in Psalm 95, <clears throat> which is celebrating the, the, the joyous power of God over all things, there's a reminder today, if you hear his voice, don't harden your heart. Don't harden your heart as your fathers did. So this is a specific message to Israel. Don't harden your heart as they did back at Meribah and Massa. We come all the way to Psalm 99, which is rejoicing in the reign of God. And there were great, there were great prophets. There were there was Moses, there was Samuel, and, and God spoke to them. They called upon him and he answered them specifically and celebrating this. And it says, and he also punished their wrongdoing. We come to Psalm 105 and 106. Psalm 105 is the enemies of Israel experienced the wrath of God. 106, Israel experienced the wrath of God. So what you've got here is the holiness of God is woven like a major thread through the tapestry of these psalms. Well, our psalm speaks to them. But also another major thread in this tapestry is the salvation, all the way from Psalm 90, all the way to Psalm 106. And the, the two psalms on either side of our psalm is celebrating the story, the, 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 the proclamation of his salvation. Psalm 98 Sing to the Lord a new song. He has done marvelous things. His right hand, his holy arm have worked salvation for him. The Lord has made known his salvation. He's revealed his righteousness in the sight of the nations. He's remembered his steadfast love and faithfulness to the house of Israel. The salvation of the Lord. Psalm 96, sing to the Lord and bless his name. Tell of his salvation from day to day. Our psalm touches upon that theme as well. So <clears throat> let's look at the individual part, the, the verses here of our psalm, and just work our way through it. I've entitled this The Coming of the King, and we begin with his reign. Psalm 97, 1, the Lord reigns, let the earth rejoice. Uh, that phrase, let the earth rejoice, is a repetition out of the previous psalm, Psalm 96, where it says, verse 11, let the heavens be glad and let the earth rejoice. That's right in that, that part of the psalm where all nature, is why it says, is singing. All, the whole earth is rejoicing. So Psalm 97 starts there. We, we start in the rejoicing of the earth because the Lord is king. He is reigning. Uh, let the earth rejoice. Let the many coastlands be glad. The, the next Psalm, Psalm 98, remember 96 and 98 are like a, it's like a sandwich with 97 in the middle. And so as we go to over to 98, we see that um, verse 3, he's remembered his steadfast love to Israel, and all the ends of the earth has seen the salvation of our God. In Hebrew poetry, the coastlands represent the ends of the earth. The coastline is a coastland because it's the coast of the sea. In other words, you go across the sea and you reach the land over there. <laughs> so it's the end of the earth just as like 98 says, that's rejoicing. And Psalm 97, let the coastlands, the many the coastlands. So the whole area here, we're talking about the whole earth rejoice, rejoicing even to the ends of the earth. That's a wonderful, that's a wonderful picture. 
Uh, when you go down to verse six uh, and read that verse, it, it makes a completed thought. The heavens proclaim his righteousness and all the peoples see his glory. So we've got the earth rejoicing, the heavens proclaiming, the coastlands are glad, all the people see his glory. This is a complete and total scene of joy. Are we talking about the way things are now? Or are we talking about the way things will be? In it's a feature in uh, Hebrew poetry and prophecy that a present tense verb is oftentimes used with a future sense. We do this in English. We, we can use a present tense when we mean future. Uh, the Lord reigns, that present tense right there is spoken of as a prophetic presence, or more technically, a prophetic perfect. Uh, it's speaking of something that is, but not entirely, it's speaking of something that will be. Certainly, when we move to the future, we see this in its full appearance. The Lord does reign now, but you don't see what you would expect from that reign in its entirety. And in order to see that, you have to move to the future. <clears throat> because it's in the future that there be a full display. This is why <clears throat> Watts's hymn, Joy to the World, when I was teaching um, classes on eschatology, on prophecy, uh, we had a, a, as a feature of that class, uh, one of the things it did was to analyze a lot of the, the hymns and Christian songs that are dealing with eschatological themes, and it's amazing how many there are, both traditional hymns and contemporary Christian music, especially contemporary Christian music. Um, there's just a lot of focus on eschatological themes, the coming of the Lord. And uh, I'd always have them look at Watts, Joy to the World, because that actually is an eschatological theme. It's speaking of something that is yet to be seen in its fullness. We're going to come into an order in which all that singing and all that rejoicing is taking place. What connects the present and the future? The present, we, we know it by faith, and we see it to some extent. The future, we see it fully. The thing that connects the two is the coming of the Lord. He comes because he is the king. And because he is the king, he comes and restores the order, implements the order that fully expresses his sovereign power and reign. Now, that's what we have in the psalm, because between verses 1 and 6, we're talking about the Lord reigning and all this rejoicing and proclaiming of his righteousness, something has to happen to see that in its fullness. And the thing that happens is the coming of the Lord. And that coming is, an ex is expressed in this psalm by a theophany. The word theophany, we've mentioned that before, it means an appearance of God, an appearing of God. And in the Bible, there are various uh, recorded theophanies. This is one of them here. We begin in Psalm 97, verse 2, describing the Lord, and it says, Clouds and thick darkness are all around him. Righteousness and justice are the foundation 
his throne. This is a pretty ominous a description of the Lord, the, the clouds and the thick darkness. What it indicates is that you, you really cannot, in, in your comprehension, in our comprehension, our human understanding cannot penetrate to fully grasp him. There is this darkness. There is this veil that prevents us from fully comprehending who he is. And that's pretty awesome. Uh, we are all made by him. We're all creatures. He is the one and only creator, utterly unique and different from us. And yet, we were made to reflect his likeness. Clouds and thick darkness are all around him. It's not only the, the incomparability, the, the inability to understand him that's represented by this language, but it goes back into biblical history. And what it's doing is telling you who he is, that he is this one who appeared this way before. The clouds and thick darkness are a reference to the way God appeared to Israel at Sinai. Moses describes it in Deuteronomy 4, a passage that we have sometimes made reference to because it's one of those very interesting passages of Scripture where Moses is preparing the people to go into the land, and he's reminding them of what happened and when they met the Lord. And he, he said, you know, that the people gathered at Horeb. It describes the mountain as Horeb here in Deuteronomy, which is the same. It's Sinai. They gathered to, to around Sinai to hear the words of the Lord. Verse 11, Deuteronomy 4, and you came near and stood at the foot of the mountain while the mountain burned with fire to the heart of heaven, wrapped in darkness, cloud, and gloom. And then the Lord spoke to you out of the midst of the fire. You heard the sound of the words, but saw no form. There was only a voice. This the, the, in, in Exodus 19 says that the mountain was covered with this cloud and this thick darkness. Here in Deuteronomy, it says there was this fire that burned to the heart of heaven, which indicated that the, the fire that they saw went straight up into heaven. Isn't that awesome? Straight up. He says, into the heart of heaven. And God spoke to them in words. And they heard it. <clears throat> in Exodus, it says that Moses, the Lord called Moses up to the mountain to speak to him. And Moses went up the mountain and entered into the darkness. And then when he came to the designated place, God spoke to him. The interesting thing about that is that for Moses, he's not able to concentrate on anything else. It's utterly dark, and God is speaking to him. So he's totally focused on the voice of God. Now, <clears throat> this is the Lord who appeared. And so in the psalm, when it talks about the Lord reigns, and so we, we begin here by a reminder of the theophany. This is the one who is covered with total darkness and with this thick cloud, who spoke to our forefathers at Sinai. 
But this is also the description of the one who is coming. Look in Zephaniah. Zephaniah is right before Agai and after Habakkuk. See there. <laughs> and so Zephaniah is one of the 12 minor prophets. All of the 12 minor prophets are consumed with one theme, one theme, and that is the day of the Lord. They're all talking about the day of the Lord. And the day of the Lord is the day of his coming, the day of his coming in judgment. Zephaniah is no exception. Three chapters. It's all about the day of the Lord. Zephaniah 1, verse 14, the great day of the Lord is near. Near and hastening fast, the sound of the day of the Lord is bitter. The mighty man cries aloud there. A day of wrath is that day, a day of distress and anguish, a day of ruin and devastation, a day of darkness and gloom, a day of clouds and thick darkness. The, the imagery is conveying the fact that this is the one who's coming. The one who appeared is the one who's coming in the day of the Lord. Malachi ends the Old Testament, the last verses in the Old Testament. Malachi 4, the day is coming, burning like an oven, when all the arrogant and all evildoers will be stubble. The day that is coming will set them ablaze, says the Lord of hosts, leaving neither root nor branch. But for you who fear my name, the son of righteousness will rise with healing in its way. So the clouds and thick darkness around him, this is the one who has come, who is the Lord who has appeared in the past. Righteousness and justice are the foundation of his throne. That's very interesting. In Psalm 93, he's robed in power. He's robed in majesty. Psalm 97, clouds and thick darkness. Psalm 93, the emphasis is on the power, the power of the Lord. Notice that it does not say that power is the foundation of his throne. But righteousness and justice are the foundation of his throne. Is that, I mean, he obviously is omnipotent. He has all. But what does it mean to say that this is the foundation of his throne is his rule. So the foundation of his throne means the foundation of his rule, his ruling, his kingdom is established on righteousness. As opposed to saying it's established on power. We live, as many of you know, in a time which many people refer to as postmodern. Uh, you may have heard that term. It's, it comes up quite a bit. Postmodern Philosophy, postmodernism, postmodern culture is one that um, does not believe in truth. There's only one thing, and that's power. Uh, there are no, there's no absolute truth. There's no abiding truths. All there is is power. Anything anybody tells you is true is a reflection of their power. And so it's a revolutionary time. The question is, who has the power? And so, you know, they, there are political forces mobilizing on behalf of these people because they want power. And when they get the power, then they control the narrative. And the narrative tells you what is true, which is not absolute. It's just a reflection of their power. To live in a world in which power is the foundation of the society is to live in a totalitarian, autocratic world. And it's a miserable place. Um, <clears throat> only somebody has the power, not others. You either have it or you are under its thumb. But the Lord, 
for him, righteousness and justice is the foundation of throne. And that's good news for all of us. Because that means that his kingdom is right. It's right. Uh, the creator is the one who designed us and made us. And so the righteousness that is the foundation of his rule over us accords with the way he made us so that we're actually fit into his creation. The foundation is not just what the throne sits on. It's the foundation. So it's the foundation rule. But the, the, the foundation of the throne is also the, what would you call it, the platform upon which he stands when he delivers judgment. The king rises from the throne, stands on that same platform and delivers judgment. That judgment is based in righteousness for the Lord. Psalm 97, verse 3, fire goes before him and burns up his adversaries all around. The fire is a theme that comes in several uh, passages of Scripture, and especially with the day of the Lord and the coming of the Lord in judgment. Isaiah 66, the Lord is coming in fire and will deal out retribution. The fire goes before him. That description, however, is very interesting. God is not the fire. Although there are uh, passages of scripture that speak of God as a consuming fire. Um, but in this scripture here, the fire is not him. It goes before him. It's as if the fire is a servant. The fire is a uh, a servant performing a function for the Lord. Notice that it goes before him. The interesting thing is, you know, you know, how do you start a fire? You know, you ignite something. With, you know, you you create the conditions. If you can create the right physical conditions, the fire will erupt. You can have a spontaneous combustion if you create the conditions correctly. The conditions before the Lord as he comes in judgment are such that it just erupts. It just erupts, which means that God is awesome. I, mean, I don't know how else to say this. To, 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 to deal with the expectation of the coming of God is something that cannot be resisted. It cannot be thwarted. He comes and he, he causes the destruction of his adversaries to just erupt. And they're all around. So if they're all around, that's an interesting figure. So here's the Lord. So that's a, that's a lot of adversaries, aren't they? And if they're all around him, they have him surrounded. Doesn't it seem sometimes like God is surrounded? You know, the, the, the purposes of God or the, 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 the forces against the Lord and the Lord's purposes are so many. The theme of surrounding here is, is a theme in, in, in the biblical narrative. We just go all the way to the end in Revelation 20 when Gog and Magog erupt from the four corners of the earth and they surround the camp of the saints. They come and surround to destroy because Satan has been released at that point. Uh, but it says fire comes from heaven, consumes them. You cannot surround him. <laughs> it's just, you cannot do it. And the, the destruction just simply erupts upon those who do. I appreciate the pastor speaking this morning on Sodom and Gomorrah. Did you notice um, 
in that, but just look at that for a moment in that passage in Genesis 19, the way that it is described there. It says that um, the Lord had caused um, had caused fire. It says in uh, Genesis nineteen twenty four, the Lord rained on Sodom and Gomorrah sulfur and fire from the Lord out of heaven. Remember at Sinai uh, that the fire from the mountain went all the way into the heart of heaven. What do you have here in, in Genesis 19? It indicates that Abraham saw that. What Moses and Israel saw, Abraham had seen that, that it came out of heaven onto Sodom and Gomorrah. And when Abraham looked at it, he saw, and it says verse uh, 28, he looked down he saw, behold, the smoke of the land went up like the smoke of a furnace. Also, <clears throat> notice that it said there um, in Genesis 19, 24, the Lord rained on Sodom and Gomorrah sulfur and fire from the Lord. The Lord rained fire from the Lord. It's a very interesting description. Early Christian theologians saw in that a, a reference to the, the complexity of the, of the personhood of God reflected in here. The Lord from the Lord. Um, well, it says here in Psalm 97, 3, fire goes before him and burns up his adversaries all around. 97, for his lightnings light up the world, the earth sees and trembles. The interesting thing about this is verse 2 said that he's surrounded by thick darkness. So the world cannot see him, but his lightnings light up the world. But the lighting up of the world is a lighting that takes place in judgment. So the world is coming to an understanding of what has gone wrong and the fact that judgment is taking place, but the illumination is taking place in the judgment itself. But it is a lighting, they're being enlightened by the lightning. The earth sees and trembles as a result. The mountains melt like wax before the Lord, before the Lord of all the earth. We've said many times that the mountains in Hebrew poetry are uh, a figure for the nations. And the mountains are indicating a, an exaltedness. There is this exaltedness of the nations. But when the Lord comes, they are all humbled. Their exalted status is brought low. So they melt like wax before him. So as he comes, they come down. Isn't that interesting? They come down. In fact, they're prostrate before him as he comes. They melt like wax. Notice the repetition before the Lord, before the Lord. The psalmist wants you to catch the point because he's the Lord of all the earth. Already these psalms, it says the mountains are his, the hills are his, the depths are his, the sea is his, the earth is his. He made it all because he's the Lord of all the earth. So he comes. And then there is this revelation. As a result of his coming, the heavens proclaim his righteousness and the peoples see his glory. Again, an allusion back to Sinai where the people saw his glory. So the people will see his glory. And there is this proclamation that the Lord is righteous. What happens next in the psalm is I call the shaming of idolatry. And I printed the text on the back so that you could continue to follow it as we continued 
uh, on our outline here. Verse seven, all worshipers of images are put to shame who make their boasts and worthless idols. Worship him, all you gods. You see how verse nine is a mirror of that? It continues the thought. For you, O Lord, are most high over all the earth, and you are exalted far above all gods. So when he comes, what happens is that all the thoughts that people have had about God and about divine power, which are idolatrous. Remember what Paul said in Romans 1, that even though um, even though he has manifested his eternal power and his deity in the things that are made, that people in their reasonings became vain and they attributed his glory to created things. They, they, they invested their perception, their uh, awareness of the power and glory of God. They attributed that to created powers. And uh, that's where we get the idols then. The idols are attempting to image those created powers. And what they reflect is that's kind of a natural theology. It's, it's the theology that people have come up with. And when he comes like this, all of that is put to shame. And you realize that all of that was wrong. They had no idea what they were talking. Uh, the idols are worthless because there's no intrinsic value to them at all. The idols were made to image what they thought were gods. The things that they called gods are natural forces. And those things all are in subservience to the one Lord God. That's at the end of verse seven. Worship him, all you gods, which is a way of saying that they're all in subservient to him. All the powers, whether it's economic power, whether it's agricultural power, it's all the, all the powers that people have worshiped, all those powers are subservient to him. And they're properly ordered when they're in worship. In the middle, between this point about the shaming of idolatry and the images that people have had and ways in which they've thought about God, is uh, verse 8, Zion hears and is glad. The daughters of Judah rejoice. The daughters of Judah are the other cities of Judah. So Zion, Jerusalem, the cities of Judah, they're rejoicing because of your judgments, O oh Lord. And why would they rejoice? Because they were given the revelation. That's the one that they <laughs> know. Uh, they knew him. Okay. All the way back to Sinai. This was the one. Okay. And even in, in, in Zion, Jerusalem, in the temple, uh, in 1 Kings uh, 8, there's a description of the Lord filling the temple after Solomon constructs it. And he dedicates it to the Lord, it speaks of the cloud and darkness that fills the temple. And the people had to get out. They're, this is the one they know. And he has been revealed in his full power and glory. And so they're glad. And glad of his judgments. Because his judgments are based on righteousness and truth. The response then of the righteous, two things, and the hatred of evil and joy and thanksgiving. So he says in Psalm 97, 10, O oh, you who love the Lord, hate evil. Verse 12, the, the, the uh, imperatives continue, rejoice in the Lord and give thanks. So hate evil, rejoice in the Lord and give thanks. Now, you may have just a slight little hesitation on the hate evil because our minds think about that hatred um, admonition and 
And we rush to Matthew where Jesus says, you know, don't hate your enemy, you know, pray for your enemy, you know, you're supposed to love your enemy. And that's true. This is not uh, hate the enemy, it's hate evil. And it's impossible to completely separate people from evil. The point, however, is uh, from a full biblical perspective, what we would desire and what the Lord himself desires. Second Peter 3, the Lord is not willing that any should perish, that all should come to repentance. And that, that every individual, even the evildoer, would come to repentance. That's that's a, a biblical perspective. At the same time, um, evil is evil. And what the Lord is calling upon his people is to hate evil. Hate the evil deed and the doing of the evil deed, the evil that comes from doing evil deeds and the effects that that has upon people and people's lives and in a whole society. There is a, for those who love God, there has to be a, a pure rejection of evil, which means First of all, it has to be named correctly. You have to know what evil is and that that is the thing that is in fact evil. And, it's, and in the process of hating evil, you rejoice in the Lord and you give thanks to his name. Now, <clears throat> remember we began this psalm, are we talking about the present time or are we talking about the future? In the future, there is no evil there. There's nobody doing that kind of thing there. That doesn't happen. The, all the pain and the misery that that causes in life is gone from there, okay? Uh, but in the present time, we do see it. The thing that connects the present to the future is the coming of the Lord. So that's why there is a desire for his coming, that he would come and he would bring his kingdom to its fullness. As the psalm ends, there's a recognition that we're in that present time. He hasn't come yet. But this is who he is. And when he comes, he will manifest the full reality of his righteousness and justice. So in the meantime, we have certain benefits. <laughs> he preserves the lives of his saints. He delivers them from the hand of the wicked. Light is sown for the righteous and joy for the upright of heart. You know, this is what we saw in Job and why our study of Job was so important. Job suffered greatly from the evil one. Uh, he suffered uh, from the hands of others, uh, but the Lord preserved his life. He didn't think he was going to live. He thought he was going to die at any moment. Uh, it was so bad, but the Lord preserved it. He delivered him. At the end of all of that suffering, he delivered him. So what is the message there? You just trust the Lord. I love verse 11, light is sown for the righteous and joy for the upright of heart. And see, there's a contrast there with verse two because there's this thick darkness that surrounds the Lord. And we can't comprehend him. Remember what he said to Job, will you even accuse me of doing wrong? And Job said, no, I'm not even going to speak. Okay? You cannot accuse him. You cannot understand him, his ways, except to the point that he reveals them. But light is sown to the righteous. He gives light. He gives light. You know, the scripture, Psalm 119, that his word is a light 
along our path, a light to our feet. It, it guides us in our walk. He gives us his word. But he gives an enlightened wisdom and understanding as we're oriented toward his future coming. As we walk through this world, trusting in him, light is sown for the righteous and joy. So he gives light and joy. Even in miserable circumstances, he gives joy. He sows it like seed sown into a heart. And you know, if you sow seed, what do you expect? You expect it to sprout and to bring forth a yield. So the question is, what is the yield of light and joy in a life? Even in a miserable situation, even when the world is not right, the Lord is still the Lord. And he will come and he will put it right. We will be in a Psalm 93 situation with the world established, manifesting the righteousness of God. So living as a believer, trusting in God in that time, trusting in him, hating evil, but rejoicing in the Lord, light is sown, joy is sown into the heart, and it brings forth its own fruit in a life walking with the Lord. And that's where we are in Psalm 97. We have a couple of minutes for comments, observations, questions, thoughts. Yes. Yeah, I feel like we're the frog in the pot. Talking about the changing the narrative. Yeah. And how then it's happened through the years. It's been a slow increase in temperature. I heard a new word this week bullying. 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 Yeah. Changing the narrative. Started out easy, mild, but now it's got to organize the bullying. Yeah. Yeah. You can't just disagree with it. You couldn't make you feel uncomfortable like well that you feel. But now it's getting really, really you know, blue. I mean you're if you disagree with homosexual, you're a homophobe. Mm -hmm. You're a homophobe. Mm -hmm. That's blue. That's pretty. Yeah. That's strong. Yeah, the, and, the, uh, the opposition. Your key word is the power. They want the power. You can not just the power. Bullying to a point, but you need the power. But, but they do. Yeah. We, uh, you're right. Um, Zoomers, Joe was talking about the, the, the bullying that takes place in the exercise of power in our culture. And uh, it is a, power expressed against the way you even think in your mind and uh, words you use and that sort of thing. So it's a, a pretty extensive attempt to reconstruct um, reality. And um, that's what we're living in. That's why I think this Psalm is so encouraging as a reminder, it's the Lord who reigns. And uh, even if it looks like they're all around the Lord to finish off the Lord, <laughs> the manifestation of God in creation, it's, that, that's not going to happen. Thank you, Joe. Other comments, thoughts, questions, observations, reflections? Yes, yeah. I haven't thought about the word evil, what it actually is. And what came to my mind it's uh, anyone or anything who opposes God and the opposes whatever form that would take. Mm -hmm. Yes. The opposition to God is the opposition. 
I think that's you're right on, Ed. Well, well framed. Anything, anything or anyone who is in opposition to God, God's plans, purposes, any opposition to God. I think that's that's well said. Yes, Barbara. Well, on verse seven, all worshipers of images are put to shame. I think today, well, obviously our culture, they're worshiping the uh, worshiping natures, and they're even being called, I mean, referring to the green dragons, you know, those who worship nature in our culture today. I'm afraid that they're going to be put to shame. Yes. Um, and yeah. then, like the pastor said this morning, that our purpose to be here is to push back against this east. <laughs> Do they even understand that their demon behind little dragon? That's it. Great breath. Good work today. Yeah. Um, yeah. Yeah. I, I think so, you know, and, and there are people who are referring to all of this as the new paganism. You know, it's a neo-paganism that is manifesting itself uh, in all of this. Um, so, yeah, there will be a surprise. <laughs> well, thank you for being with us this morning. Next week, we look at Psalm 99. We're making our way toward the end of this little group of psalms. I think we'll find it very interesting as the rejoicing cranks up again here. And uh, we'll be finishing our group of psalms in uh, the next two weeks, the Divine Enthronement Psalms. So let's pray together. Father, we do thank you that you are the Lord, that you are the Creator, we thank you for your omnipotent power, that you are sovereign over all things. But, Lord, we rejoice that righteousness and justice are the foundation of your rule and your reign. Thank you, Lord, for, for the fact that we can trust in you and Thank you for the light and the joy that you give even in the midst of difficult times. We pray that you would sow that light, that you would sow that joy into our hearts as we walk with you. Thank you for the great grace that you've given us in the Lord Jesus. Enable us to be a light in the midst of a dark world. And we pray that the light of the gospel may yet penetrate many, many other hearts. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. <clears throat>